points in one dimension? Did you it's now flashing, so everything should be working. All right, so thank you very much to the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, participate in this program. Uh, I, I like it very much, and I very much enjoy the discussions. Um, so, uh, so let's see uh, what we get out of my talk here. Um, I will be talking to you about something which is uh, somewhat different from most of the talks this week, uh, because I will change the dimension of space. Um, so that's probably the, the sort of uh, biggest difference. Uh, and then I will basically just talk about standard quantum mechanics in one dimension. So it, it should not be, it's not uh, super advanced, but there are new results in this, surprisingly. Um, so that's what uh, I will try to convince you, that it's not uh, a problem that is as well understood as many people may have thought for a long time. I mean, you always hear about 1D, you know, that's nice, you know, stuff is solvable, you can solve n-body problems, you can take beta ansatz, um, but uh, it's not so clean if you, um, if you actually have uh, any kind of confinement on your system. So you're keeping it, in, you, you have a 1D system, but you have to put it in a box somehow. So to make these experiments, you put it in a box. And that kind of thing typically messes up uh, the access to these old and exact results. So you have to try something else. Of course, you can do numerics, and I will also come back to that. Um, and, uh, and that's also a pretty strong thing to do, but there are some overlooked things, in particular in the uh, strongly interacting uh, limit. Um, and I will come back to exactly what I mean by strongly interacting and define the potential. Do the symbols at the bottom of your talk mean something? Yes, uh, yes. Um, so I was already, let's see. <laughs> this is a, an alphabet that was designed by uh, some people who were um, commissioned to do it by my university because they wanted to spend a lot of money to promote the university, which is one out of seven universities in a country of five million. So of course it makes sense to spend a lot of money promoting a university, right? It's in the several million euros, but there's no disclosure about how much it costs exactly. But that's okay. estimate. It says Aarhus University. <laughs> <laughs> it says Aarhus University, yeah. Um, <laughs> Didn't you see that? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. All right, so we go to a one-dimensional world, and uh, what I will be talking about is um, bosons and fermions, but they will be um, multi-component, and in the sense of uh, having uh, a spin, for instance. Um, and you can think of it, I will only be talking about two-component things. So you can think of these fermions as spin up, spin down. So it's spin half fermions, <coughs> traditional sense. Uh, and then, of course, uh, <coughs> I want to compare to uh, what happens for identical bosons. And I want to uh, exclusively talk about an interaction that looks like this. So short-range interaction. And I will model that short range. So what I'm assuming here is that the range of the potential is the smallest scale in my problem. So I might as well just use a delta function. And a delta function in one dimension is very well defined. You can work with that. and you don't get into trouble, it's, it, uh, it's regular and, and very nice. So, uh, so that's a nice thing to work with, so I will just make that assumption. And then we put some strength on this, um, which I call G1D, which is the interaction strength between uh, two particles. Um, and then you can plot a relative wave function of two particles, and these could be two identical bosons, or they could be a spin up and a spin down fermion. And then as a function of this uh, coupling uh, strength here, you will find, uh, so this is plotted, uh, these are two particles in a harmonic trap. So here we are in the ground state of the harmonic trap, which is just a Gaussian. And then we start turning the interaction, we crank it up, and then the delta function puts a little kink here in the middle where the two uh, particles feel each other, and that becomes very large if we take this limit. And this is what I will call a strongly interacting limit. So we take this constant and we send it to infinity. What that means for an actual experiment is, of course, just that it's the largest scale in the problem. I mean, this, this interaction energy is the largest scale in the problem. So at that point, what actually happens is that the wave function goes to zero. They cannot overlap anymore. It makes kind of physical sense that if 
you have an infinite interaction sitting somewhere, the wave function does not want to be there because it will cost an infinite energy. So the wave function goes nicely to zero in the system. And you can even go across from plus infinity to minus infinity and see that then it over kind of overshoots and at when it comes back to uh, zero in the negative on the negative side, uh, it becomes uh, uh, an excited state actually. Yeah. So there plus minus infinity and the picture is the same, or do you really mean plus infinity? Yeah. In yes. Yes. Picture is exactly the same. There's only one difference. It is that if I'm at very strong negative g, there can be molecular states. So deeply bound molecular states. I will completely ignore them in this talk. They're not, I mean, I will almost exclusively talk about what goes on on the repulsive side. So this, this picture is just to show you that you can sort of continue this, this gain. So it, there's no, I mean, I will, not, I will not use this for anything. Because when you get to the attractive side, you do get very deeply bound molecules. And I will not be interested in those. All right, good. And then, uh, then comes this word about, uh, well, if it's strongly interacting, right, I can also call this the impenetrable regime. Because what it actually means is that the wave function goes to zero and they cannot penetrate through each other. That's, that's kind of the, the, the way you can interpret this. Now, uh, there's a lot of work in uh, strongly interacting boson systems. And um, some of this uh, famous work uh, in this, uh, in the limit where this um, G1D goes to infinity uh, is by, uh, there was a paper by Tunks and there's a paper from 1960 by Xiaodou. Um, and what it, you know, what Xiaodou kind of nicely uh, describes in his paper, or proves in his paper if you like, is that if I take a bunch of, uh, of identical bosons uh, sitting on a line and I take a short range uh, delta function interaction, take uh, the G to go to infinity, then I can actually map that into a problem of identical fermions, so spin polarized fermions. And then the ground state of the bosonic system will just be the absolute value of the fermionic system. I mean, it kind of makes sense because, at least to me it makes sense, because what you're doing is that you're taking a wave function which is totally anti-symmetric, and then you just, so, so it, it always ensures that whenever two particles overlap it's zero, and then you take the absolute square so that your Fermi statistics becomes Bose statistics. So, so that's the sort of intuition of why you can use this wave function. Um, right, and, and uh, um, well, okay, I, won't, I will actually not get into this beta and such discussion, so that's maybe, uh, but for historical, I mean, I guess historically it's interesting um, that these, uh, all of these models um, of for 1D n-body systems it was a field that really exploded in the, in the 1960s, in particular starting from Leap and Linnitzsch's solution to uh, um, a model of uh, identical bosons with an arbitrary positive G. So arbitrary um, repulsive interaction. That can be solved and it's done by, by what is known as pain answers. I will not uh, return to that anyway, so that's a historical comment. Um, so why is this interesting now? It's interesting because you can experimentally realize these kinds of 1D systems. So what you do is that you take a, a gas of uh, cold, uh, a cold atomic gas, and then you apply laser fields to this gas. <coughs> and if you do it uh, uh, in, uh, if you have uh, coming in from three directions, you can build these uh, very nice uh, 3D lattices. But if you have them coming from two directions, you can build uh, a very nice structure of tubes. So, so this has been, you know, that has been explored for, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. Very nice experiments on this kind of stuff. Um, so you can really, you can really do uh, a very nice 1D geometry by confining these atoms this way. And then there's another thing which is very important is that you can also, so you can work with the Fesbach resonances just like you do in 3D gases. But once you confine your gas to uh, a lower dimensional setting, like this 1D setting here, then what you get is a so-called confinement-induced resonance. And Maximal Shani showed at some point that this G1D can actually be obtained, so the effective interaction in this 1D uh, system can be obtained from the uh, dynamics or from the, the uh, uh, 3D Fesbach resonance through this kind of formula. So you see that there will also be a resonance, right, when, when this guy is equal to one, this setup here. 
Uh, it's not at the same point as the resonance in the 3D case, but there will be an associated resonance. Um, so that means that you can tune this guy. So you can actually tune the one-dimensional effective coupling in this system. So uh, that's, that's uh, how, how tightly are you confining these guys. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's the harmonic, uh, how, how tight is your confinement? Yeah, sorry, I did, I did not mention that. No, that's a good question. Yeah. Can yeah. The yes? Sorry, no, no, don't so you worry. Just rate this as psi B is equal to absolute value of psi F. Yes. So for the two particle system, that's certainly true. Yes. Um, for the many body or yes. more than two particles, yeah. wouldn't you have the mapping function? That's a little bit more complicated. Not for identical because bosons. For, for the ground state. For for the ground state. Okay. Yes, oh, sorry, okay, if that's what you're asking, yes, absolutely true. It's only for the ground state. Mm -hmm. If you go higher, then yes, you get a problem. You, you, now you want to play with nodes and things like that. So, okay. so yes. If you multiply absolutely. the exact state of quadratic region by the signature or the order of the coordinates. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, that, that, that's, that's true, yes. So, you, so you, you need something more complicated. No, I agree. Okay. I agree. Yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, this is a ground state statement, yes. But I mean, even if you go to momentum space, right, there's a difference between. So, I mean, uh, an identity like this had, has made people sort of have these claims about hardcore bosons or strongly, strongly repulsive bosons and, and spin polarized fermions are sort of the same in 1D. But if you go to momentum space, you can immediately see the difference. So, it's not, I'm not claiming anything beyond this, this one thing. Ground state, you can get this way. Two? No. This is my what my no. This is what my talk is about. No, you cannot. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, you cannot. Um, and I will. I will make a three-body uh, example where it's kind of. It should. I hope it's clear from that. Um, experimental realization. I. You know. I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time on this, but you could. I mean, it turns out that you can realize this very strongly interacting uh, one-dimensional. A Bose gas, so you take identical bosons and you turn up the interaction, and you can actually make something that uh, act, uh, that looks like this Tong Xiaodou gas. Um, uh, and these two papers have have very nicely proven that that that's on the repulsive side. Uh, on the attractive side, there's been some papers that were uh, 2009 from um, Innsbruck, uh, and and again you can also do it on. In principle, you can you can. Uh, continue from the repulsive onto the um, attractive branch in some sense. Uh, this is, uh, these are just experimental data. It's because of the way they uh, probe these gases by looking, by uh, shaking and then looking at the monopole mode. Um, so, and there's some theory curves and it nicely fits. I will not get into any of the details of this because I just don't know it. Um, so let's instead go to the 1D fermions and now come back to a two-component system because that's more interesting, I, I definitely agree. So if we got uh, two component, um, uh, we got, so let's take a, a spin up and a spin down system, right? Then I can draw this picture again. I mean, that, that's, that's the same picture as for two identical um, bosons. However, if I take two identical, you know, nothing happens. I, I just have my anti-symmetric wave function and, and that's it. That, that, that's all I have. So, so that's, that's the difference between these two in the two-body sector, right? I mean, this, I hope you all agree that this is sort of, you know, relatively straightforward. This. Um, now, how, what, then what do you do to actually figure out how does this work out in an experiment? And what is so amazing about it is that you can actually do an experiment in a 1D system with two particles. So that's the sort of, that's, that's the sort of amazing thing that, that came out with this paper is that you can go down to two particles in a 1D setup, you can tune your interaction, and you can do these kinds of experiments. And how do you do them? Well, you take, uh, you take a trap, and then uh, you can either take the up-down system or the up-up system, and then you, you open your trap on one side. And then you, you study what actually what tunnels out. So you open it slightly, and you keep opening it, and then you watch what, what is tunneling out. And then if, it looks, if the system starts out with two uh, spin polarized fermions like this, then you expect, okay, well, it tunnels out as soon as you know, the rate becomes large enough for this guy to go over the barrier. I mean, it's, 
you can do this in WKB. I mean, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a super advanced theory. Um, whereas if I'm in the up-down system, then it depends on the interaction. So it really depends on how big is the interaction uh, here. So, so as I increase my interaction, yeah. Uh, just one question for my understanding. The one D trap, so what you show as a potential is in the, in the really in the one D direction. So the confinement in, yes. the, in the other two directions is even much larger. Yes, yes. Okay. It's complete. There's because it looks absolutely confined along the Z direction well, as well now. So okay, okay, okay. That, that's I, I agree. I agree. It, 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 that's to to squeeze out the difference. You know, I want to see the level difference here, and that and it is highly confined. And that it, it's so highly confined that you can easily see that you have a you have a level spacing also in the trap, in the uh, in the one D direction, so to speak. So, so that. I would call it one D with a harmonic trap. Okay. If I mean. So, do you see what I'm saying? The aspect ratio is about 10 between the trap frequency and the yes. direction. Yes, that is true. Yes. Okay. So you have to you have to put about 10 particles before you start to feel the that next th the next thing. Yeah, okay. yeah. So so it's pretty big. So as long as we're at two here, we're okay. okay. I don't know, but that, it, it's a it's a good question. Um, just to show you some experimental data from this paper here. So the the uh, the resonance. Uh, sits around here, and the point is that when you're when you're at the resonance, you actually and let me go back to uh, the wave function. You can see that I mean, so this is what is called fermionization here, right? Because this wave function and this wave function are similar. If I just flip this guy up, right? So you so you expect that I mean the energy of this guy is also the same. <coughs> so that means that at this point. At the, at the point when, when the interaction goes to infinity, I expect that the up-down and the down uh, and the up-up system should behave in the same way. And this is what you see here. So this is these tunneling times actually meet around here within sort of whatever error bars is here. And you also nicely see that if I just take the two um, uh, spin-up fermions, then nothing ever changes to this tunneling rate. They don't, they, they don't feel the interaction, right? So I change my and they don't feel it. So, so I think this is a very beautiful experiment to show that you can actually do two-body physics with short-range interactions in a harmonic trap with very few particles. Um, right. Now, OK, let's complicate things and put three fermions. So if I have three fermions, then um, let me just, for the sake of argument, I take two up and one down. And then the you know, what's the wave function, the relative wave function between the two up? Well, it has to kind of look like that, right? I mean, it's two identical particles, so it has to be anti-symmetric. Okay. Now, between these two guys, I mean, and I'm interested in strong interactions again, I now, <laughs> there's two choices. Because, you know, I can either take that guy, or I can take that guy. This guy is not disallowed, right? I mean, I can easily, I can use this wave function, but I can also use this wave function. So there's, there's, you know, there's some, there's something which one, you know, which one should I actually, which one is realized in an experimental setup? And there was this, uh, no, okay, I choose to call it a conjecture, but there was this uh, um, conjecture that it, it's always in the, in the uh, non-identical, between the non-identical particles, it's always this symmetric guy. That, that, so you can just build the wave function by just saying, well, between every Identical, I need an anti-symmetric, and between every non-identical, I need a, a, a symmetric guy. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. Why is that not clear from symmetrization? It looks like I need a orbital symmetric wave function for anti-symmetric. What do you mean? I mean, I, I, I just think of these two particles. Then I, I take the interaction to go to uh, uh, infinity. Then okay. this is an allowed wave function. This is an allowed wave function. Okay. OK. OK, OK. It, uh, yeah, no, I agree. So um, but let's try, let's try to keep an open mind, because actually what you can go back and say is that it's actually all you have is a requirement that the wave function goes to 0 at 0 here. That's all you know. You just know that it has to just go to 0. So you could actually just play with linear combinations of these guys. They both go to 0. 
so that's okay. And and so you can you can play with and and the way that I, you know, usually draw this is to say, well, it has to go to zero, but the derivative on both sides of this is something that it it, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter what I take. So so the idea is actually to sort of say, let me just let me just take you know I split my my space into two regions, and then I say. I take some wave function over here, which is, which is this guy, times some coefficient. And I take some other wave function, which, uh, it's the same guy, right? It's just here it's inverted. So, and then I put some other coefficient over here. I mean, so I just, I just take the most general thing I can do. And so that's the idea. So take just, you know, you take this, uh, you take the non, uh, sorry. OK, let me just, I go back one more. And I take this kind of wave function on both sides, but with a arbitrary coefficient. But why naively um, the derivative should also be continuous? And if you solve the Schrodinger equation, you have certain continuity requirements. So here this the is derivative is not continuous with a zero range interaction. I mean, if, if I have, it's a zero range interaction, right? So the derivative is discontinuous. Okay, so but an experiment is not zero range. No, no. Uh, well, it's the smallest range, which means, I mean, you, I mean, I, yeah, I could go back to the picture of two and say, look, the model works, right? So it, it is so short range that you may as well say that whatever goes on in the finite range region is completely unresolvable. So it looks, it looks exactly like this picture here. And, and this has nothing to do with the fact that uh, the, the, this, is, the, this is just the property of the delta function. Yes. Interaction and nothing to do with the strength that it, you, you want to have. No, it, it, no matter which strength you put, you're going to get a little kink. And uh, that's exactly how, you know, you, you can also say it this way. Uh, actually, if you want to put a delta function into action, you usually do it as a boundary condition anyways. And the boundary condition exactly says that the delta function strength is the difference in the derivative going across uh, the zero here. Yeah, sure. If you think about the regularized delta function and taking the limit, does okay. it mean that the state where it's regularized actually make a difference whether it's attractive or... What do you mean regularized in this sense? Like just take a finite... finite with, take a limit of Gaussian. Okay, yes? Then when you make that attractive, doesn't that increase the probability? When you make it attractive? Yeah, with, with the negative G. Yeah, yeah, okay, but I want to avoid this. I, I agree, yes, it does. And this is the this is the very, very... You get very, very bound molecular states. Right, but, but at, from your picture, as soon as you say it's negative infinity, it goes back to the king going down to zero, or is it actually infinite deep? You can have both. Yeah, yeah, you, it, it's true, yes. Okay, you don't consider it. So. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we throw away the infinitely m deeply bound states in this way. Out they go, because we're actually interested, and I'll show you a picture of, of the. Um, of the uh, energy spectra. We're more interested in going from the weakly repulsive to the strongly repulsive regime. So, so that's, I mean, it's, it's a mental picture. So, okay. Um, okay, so the idea is just to keep these as, uh, three para uh, as three parameters that you can vary. And then solve the problem this way. So you, uh, so let's say, okay, so we split the space in patches. We got one, two, and, and we got two spin up and one spin down. And you can split your coordinates here. And I, I've written uh, a relative coordinate uh, between the two identical. And then uh, that's the x. And y is the distance to the, to the spin down. OK, so it's kind of standard choice here. And then I can split all of these, uh, of the space of x and, and, and y here. I can split into six uh, regions here. And then I know that Pauli principle requires it to be anti-symmetric across this line because that corresponds to x to minus x here. So that's what I know. So I can concentrate on this region because I know what I should put on the other side if I'm done with that. So I can concentrate about this stuff. And on exactly on these two lines here, you will have a, a up and down come together on these two lines here. So the, so the thing I'm saying about keeping an open mind and taking the derivatives uh, as your, as your uh, variational parameter, if you like, is just to say, OK, I'm going to put in here, I'm going to put a, a, the wave function of three identical fermions in this region with a coefficient of a1. I'm going to do the same in this region with a coefficient of a2. 
and I'm going to do the same in this region with a coefficient of a3. So now I'm exploiting the fact that actually the, the energy of the system, because of the way the, the zeros, I mean, it, it still has to uh, let me go back to this. So, so no matter whether I, I'm, I'm in the, um, sorry, the, the state that I take here is the, uh, the non-intacting state is the sort of the one for identical spin polarized fermions. So I'm taking a state here, which I call anti-symmetric here, that is a completely, um, so you can think of it as just putting one particle in the low state, one particle in the next state, and one particle in the third state, anti-symmetrize that guy. So just take the anti-symmetrized product of this guy. It will have an energy and it will be constant because it's always zero whenever two particles overlap anyway. So it, it just, it's a line like that. But now to get the other states in the spectrum, then I need to be, you know, I need to be, uh, I need to put down a more general wave function. And what I do is that I actually, I take this guy and then I give it a coefficient a1, a2, and a3 in the, in the different orderings here. So that's up, up, down, that's up, down, up, and that's down, up, up. So these are the different things. And exactly on these lines will I have a pair of up, down coming together. So this is where, on these lines, is where I, I have to uh, you know, play with my derivative. And what you then do is that you say, well, OK, around infinity here, I can write down um, the energy in perturbation theory. And then I can take the derivative of the energy with respect to the coupling constant, my g. So that, that's just, you know, just, uh, and then it's more convenient to take it with respect to 1 over g. I'm plotting this with respect to 1 over g so that infinity lies at 0. Right? That's just, I'm, I'm interested in very strong, so I plot it with 1 over g. And then I, what I can do is that I can write down the wave function if I make this choice, a1, a2, a3, and then I can write down the first order correction from that wave function. And then I get this factor of g squared out here, but the delta function uh, can be, um, so I, I will then take, exploit the fact that the delta function uh, gives me this boundary condition that we talked about. So it, it's actually, I can use the boundary condition instead, and I can actually eliminate this factor of g. So this k here is a quantity that in the end does not depend on, on, the, um, on the strength. It's just the derivative of a given wave function <coughs> around this point at infinity. Now, you can also write it down. It actually has an exact expression for harmonic oscillator case. So you take a harmonic oscillator with these three particles, then you can calculate this exactly. It's a function of the, of the a1, a2, and a3. And, and even, you know, you can fully uh, uh, analytically calculate the factor and everything. It's, very, it's a very nice example. Um, and then the idea is basically just to kind of extremize, right? So just optimize the derivative because, well, if I'm around this point here, the ground state will be the guy with the largest derivative. The excited state will have a smaller derivative and the uh, non-intacting state will have zero derivative. So that was the original idea. The original idea is very simple. You just, you plug in the most general uh, wave function you can and then you look for a, an extreme uh, point of this, which is a functional of a1, a2, and a3 uh, so slope. What are the definitions of you they're just numbers. It's it's a multiplicate. It multiplies the wave function, so it multiplies. The, I, so I put a wave function in this region, in this sector, which is the which is the anti-symmetrized wave function, completely anti-symmetrized wave function. So the one where I put one, these three, one in the lowest, one in the second lowest, one in the third lowest. I anti-symmetrize this product. A1 is a number. So over here in this region, I take the anti-symmetrized wave function. I'm, I'm building the most general wave function I can. So I should, I should specify the wave function in every region. Do you agree? Yes. OK. So I put in all regions, I put the same wave function. I put this guy. What is your expression? This expression for the wave. So, so if, I, if I go to the. Uh, so let's, what did I call it, A? So the anti-symmetrized guy. So it's this. So I take the, so let's say this is, this is an oscillator wave function. 
in the zero state, right? So x1 and x2 is in the first excited and x3 is in the second. And then I take the anti-symmetrization on this guy. And yes, yes. So I, I anti-symmetrize this. And then you have a coefficient a1. And now, now that, that's, that's my basic function, right? Okay. And then what I'm saying over here is that I take this guy. So I realize now that my figure is not very good. I take this guy, and then in every region I say a1 times this guy, a2 times this guy, a3 times this guy, right? So I, I do like this. Now, this function is very, very nice because it fulfills my boundary condition. It's always zero on these lines and also on this line. It's also anti-symmetric with respect to this if I just pick the right, the same coefficients over here so, so as to, what do they call it, four, five, and six. So, so I, I do that all the way around. So that's... Uh, let's see. Yes, yes, yeah, that must be true. Yes, that, so okay. that's right. That is too wide. Yeah, this this <laughs> this should have been. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's it's not normalized. I agree. The coordinates are, have the wrong normalization. Yes, I agree. Yes, yes, that is true. I I agree. That's sloppy notation. Yes, yes. All right. There's no significance. It's just a it's just a picture. When you really do it, you do normalize them in the right way. You take the unitary transformation when you go to the coordinates. So yes, yes. No, no. Yes. Thank you. That that's that that's actually a very good question. I think this makes it. I hope this makes it more clear. Right. So so why? Okay. You, you can also ask why do I take this function at all? It's because I know it. It's because that's the guy I know. I know that at this point, there this guy is a solution. It's actually a solution everywhere, but I know that it's definitely also a solution at infinity. So it's a very good starting point, and it's very easy to build this guy, because I just take the single particle solutions of the harmonic oscillator, three of those guys, and then I anti-symmetrize. <coughs> That's a solution. I, can, I could have put all these coefficients to be the same, then I would just have the totally anti-symmetric function, the one that would not feel any interaction. So now I want the interaction, for the interacting solutions also around here. So I want the other solutions around here. So I built them by starting from this function, which I always know how to do. I mean, I know how to produce this guy. So now the question is, can I find the other guys by starting from a basis of this guy? And the answer is yes, I can do that. All right, should I? Thanks. All right. Okay, I hope that made it a little bit more, little bit more clear. Um, okay, so, so you, can, you can work it out. You can calculate this guy, and you can find the, the slope uh, of, the, of a general wave function with, with these coefficients. And that's the expression. Then you take the derivatives with respect to a1, a2, and a3. You set them equal to zero. You just, you, you just solve for the extreme <laughs> points. And then you get solutions. It's an eigenvalue problem when you, when you do it, right? It's a polynomial divided by another polynomial, so you can write it as an eigenvalue problem. Uh, and then you, get, then you get the solutions. You get something where they're all the same, which is just a non-intacting guy. And then you get other solutions. There's something where a1 is equal to uh, a3, and there's nothing in the a2. So this solution has the special property that, and if I go back over here, it has the special property that uh, this region was the one where you had up, down, up, right? Mm -hmm. So that solution doesn't have any probability to find the down in the middle. It will always be on the side, because there's only probability in these two regions, where it was up, up, uh, up, up, down, and the other way around. So, and here's the ground state. The ground state has some non-trivial coefficients, which are different from, from one. And I think you know, the important point I wanted to make here was just that these coefficients I mean, here's, for a non-intacting solution, they're all equal. And you could say, OK, they're, they're you know, prob no, probably normalized. They're just equal to 1. Um, but there will be ratios in general to find all these other states. You will get non-trivial ratios between these coefficients. And that actually is a way to solve the problem here. Two linear order in 1 over g. I mean, I used linear perturbation theory in 1 over g. So I get a solution to linear order in 1 over g. So that's what I call strongly interacting systems. They all go to the same, exactly right. You cannot say what is ground state and what is non No, no, but now, 
But then I come back to my experimental point about you're never quite exactly at this point. You're coming in through through some state out here and then going into the. Uh, it will be easier to show you in a figure in a, in a minute. Uh, here, here it is, right? So here's here's actually this is a numerical calculation. Um, uh, this is uh, yeah uh, one that we've done with a group in Sweden. Um, but I want to point out here that uh, it's almost lost down here. But her daughter also did this with Ibrahim. Uh, um, and here's the uh, here's the ground state, for instance. So here out here is non-interacting, um, and you have a ground state, and then it goes into this point where the three states meet, uh, and and you're absolutely right. They all become degenerate at this point. But of course, what you're interested in is you know the region around here. So really, that's what you do experimentally. You go into this region here. So so the question is. Now, where do you start, right? Because if I start in the ground state, I'm going to end up there. If I start in an excited state like this, I'm going to end up there. And if I start in a non intacting state, I'm not going to move at all. I'm just going to go right through. Um, so there's some preparation uh, to be thought of here. Yeah. The light lines are the, the deep states. Yes. Neglect. Yes, exactly. So on the, uh, they don't exist on the repulsive side, but uh, but they exist over here. So then numerically, you can determine the deep states. That is absolutely true. So so that that's perfectly possible to do. Um, there's a funny way to plot this, um, which is basically just saying that you can actually so they they connect on the side here, right? You can see that this this energy and this energy. If you plot it too far enough, you see that they actually go to the same energy asymptotically. So it's very nice to so the non-interacting region is on the far side of this of this guy and you can follow a state going from molecular ground state and then around and then it gets this kink here and then it goes to some non-intacting and then it goes around again so so it's a it's just a fancy way of plotting it i could not resist uh, showing you this uh, yes no no you you have to you have to think about what the parity of the state is so that you know exactly what it's supposed to meet on the other so side how do you make pictures that's my question what's the plotting program <laughs> Oh, this this I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I I will. Uh, th this was done by a student in Sweden, so I I, I just I uh, I was only involved in suggesting that this may be funny to plot it this way. Basically, you fold you fold the the one-dimensional lines. Yeah, exactly. Right yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You compactify the lines. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly, so exactly. Yeah, and. and 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 zero plus minus is also the same point, right? So you you connect them at the at the state there. So <laughs> not really, because you can't do an experiment like this, right? You can't cross this way. So well, so that much. that's the. You can change the g to any value. Right? Yeah, but <laughs> yes, you can, but you can't come back to the same point, right? I mean, so so you. All right, all right, all right. If you had a couple of Festbach resonances, yes. But otherwise, you're tuning in and going to some finite value of G at both ends, right? It's some different value. But, but you, you can't really go back to the value. If you st let's say you start all the way out here. And then you tune across here. Then on this side of the magnetic field, there will just be some value, right? I mean, if you're far from the resonance, it goes to some value. And so, I mean, you can't really, it's not. You can do a proper change of Yeah, 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 but you, you yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, but now we need a system where this is also. It takes oh, okay, okay. Now, okay. Th then nothing of this will work, of course. That's a no, boson and blah blah blah. It. No, no, I, I agree. I agree. You, you could, you could try this way. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I got your attention with this. <laughs> All right. I think I probably have to uh, speed up a little bit here. All right, so just to show you something about uh, the characteristics of the state. So if you're in the ground state, what it actually shows is that you're dominated by a... Um, the ground state gets dominated by the state where the spin up sits in the middle. Uh, sorry, the spin down sits in the middle. So it gets a dominant because this contribution A2 is twice as large as the two other contributions. So you get a dominant behavior. So what happens is here you plot the density of the spin down, and you see that it sits very nicely in the middle. This is that's uh, a uh, oh sorry, the blue is a non-intacting state. So that's if it would just be totally anti-symmetrized. So you see, it's definitely not that kind of state. 
Um, and over here, you see the two ups, and they go to the side. So they're pushed to the side. So that, that's in the density. You can see that. Um, and if you plot, but only if you plot the spin resolved density. If you plot the total density, it goes to a very nice fermionized wave function with three humps because there are three particles. So, so in the spin resolve, you can really see that it goes to the middle. Um, here's some occupation number. I will not bore you with this. Maybe, uh, no more time. Uh, all right, and then there's a whole discussion. This I actually won't get into. Um, let, me, um, let me just point out that these experiments have now been extended to larger systems also. So it's not only two-body. Uh, it's now also, I think, up to six here, right? <coughs> yes, uh, so, so what they can do now is that they can take a spin down and then put multiple spin ups into this system and try to make a little Polaron, if you like, um, one atom at a time. And this is this very nice science paper that came out last year where you're sort of observing the, the generation of a Fermi C one particle at a time. Um, uh, this is some energy measurements. And then uh, down here, here it's actually plotted. I'm sorry, you can't quite see that. This is actually one over G, more or less rescaled. Uh, but this is more or less what I call one over G on the, on the other plots. Uh, and then, um, what are you supposed to see in this plot? Um, well, there's a couple of, I guess, uh, I guess this, this is the, that's the two-body line, right? And this is three-body, and this is an n-body calculation. So, so, the, so this is uh, Daughter's uh, um, three-body calculation in the, in the green line here uh, from this reference. And then the, uh, this um, orange line here, uh, it's a it's a funny theory actually. So it's taken from so somebody uh, uh, Maguire solved the uh, problem of uh, a bunch of spin ups and one spin down on a line with periodic boundary conditions. And I think that's very important to remember. It's with periodic boundary conditions. Um, and then that theory was extended by Astahachik and Bussas into something um, where you take a local density approximation for the trap. And so you combine this kind of periodic boundary condition result with a local density approximation for the trap. And then you get this very nice orange line. And you see that it actually fits quite well uh, for, the, for the larger number of particles here um, up to a certain extent. I mean, the problem is that the results are not that close to my strongly intacting regime. So I'm, I'm not really, uh, I mean, what I can say is that the slope of this line is wrong. I mean, that's very easy to calculate. And you can calculate that. And that has to do with the fact that you use periodic boundary conditions and local density. Local density doesn't work for very small systems. It seems pretty obvious for this one. Uh, so, th so this slope will be wrong. But of course, there's no data out there. So you can't really see it. So this is a highly distorted thing. What I want to say about this is actually uh, my own personal opinion is that the energy in this kind of system, in the strongly intacting regime, it doesn't really matter a lot because yeah, I can predict the energy by just taking an anti-symmetrized function. It's just a s the energy will just be the same as this. I mean, I have a huge degeneracy, as I showed, or it was three for my three-body case, right? Um, so what's interesting is the wave function. So you need the wave function. And that's the next thing I will do is, you know, how can you access something like the wave function? But you can do these kinds of experiments, again, where you open the trap up, just like in the two-body case. You can do that for the three-body case also. And there you will have access to information about the wave function. How are they actually distributed uh, in, the, in the trap here? So, so, that, that's, the, um, so that, that's the idea. These experiments have been done, but they're unfortunately still uh, unpublished. Um, I think they're, getting, they're writing a paper right now about it. So they should be uh, online at some point soon. Um, here's uh, our theory uh, calculation of this kind of pro process. Uh, and let me just speed up to the point here. Um, here's, here's my uh, strongly intacting point. So this is when g goes to infinity. You see the data point is there. Uh, the theory is, uh, the blue one is uh, a theory curve. This is not a very, it's a, it's a rather simple calculation what we're doing here. It's a transition state <coughs> model uh, that Badin invented for something in Josephson junctions back in the uh, 60s, I guess. Uh, <coughs> but the important point is that this doesn't go to one third. So if, if I was in a completely anti-symmetrized state, the chances of getting the spin down out, which is, uh, sorry, I didn't say that. This is spin down divided by total. So the chances of getting a spin down out is one third because they're just completely fermionized and they all behave the same. And it, it's, it, it does not go to that. But of course, 
there's no error bar in this. And what I'm told is that the error bar is probably of the order of something like 5%. So it's not great. This is not a telltale uh, experimental signature. Um, you can find it if you go to 3 plus 1 instead of 2 plus 1. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here you go to ground state. Here you go to ground state. Okay. Yes, you are absolutely right. It depends on that. Yes. It depends how you go to there, right? Otherwise, there are exactly, exactly. And that, this is what you can do now. You can do quantum engineering of your state, of course. This, this is very nice. So yes, and but here it's done by preparing the ground state here, yeah. and then go through. But no, that's a very good point. No, sorry, your theory also says that it's not one third, right? Yes. It's, it's very consistent you with the... I'm, I'm yeah, well, you know, I mean, this, this toy model theory, actually, uh, those points are pretty... That, that theory gets exactly what I was telling you here, that that's supposed to go through. And you see that there is a discrepancy here of some few percent here. So it's still not very good. And if the error bars are big, so, you know, I'm just showing you that we can kind of get the trend right of, of, of pretty much all the data when we try. So, so at least that, that's good. Um, but that's also possible to do in, with other calculations that actually go through one third. So again, uh, there's, a, there's a large uncertainty because um, when you do these calculations for strong interactions, you have a large degeneracy and this is hard to handle. In Uh, so, oh yeah, so you're talking about, uh, this is a good question. This error is more important than that. I agree. And the, all I, I don't know, but what I know is that when they did these experiments, they changed the value of this Fesbach resonance. I don't know whether you saw these papers, but they actually changed the value of the big resonance in uh, lithium. Yeah, I mean, they corrected so the Markin scale level result. For, for instance, his result, but every result that was basically based on that. So it moved around, so the value has changed. Yes, so, okay, there is an uncertainty on this, I agree. Um, okay, four body, I should probably hurry up. The story is the same with four body. You go into, you, you, uh, you figure out what are all the configurations, just like over here, what, what kind of configurations do I have? How can I distribute the particles? Um, I know at strong interaction, they're supposed to have a zero in the, whenever two particles meet, so I can always do the split into different configurations. Uh, some terminology I invented, you know, you could call this a fair magnet because the uh, two spin up goes to the side and the two spin down goes to the side. Here's a, some kind of anti fair magnetic, uh, and here's some mixed system where they sit like this. Um, again, you will get this kind of result. You will, when you go to very strong coupling, you get a bunch of degenerate states and you can calculate these slopes to first order in one over G perturbation theory. Um, here's some associated. Uh, these, are, these are the wave functions or the, the, the configuration space wave functions of uh, the states out here. Um, let me just show you a little bit. You can also do this for excited states because you can always predict the excited state will have a different non-interacting state. It will have a different state which is flat. So I start from that state instead and I predict the excited state. That gives me different uh, values, so the slope will change, but I can use exactly the same technique to get to this, which basically just means that I can solve the whole spectrum. I mean, it, this is completely, well, this is all I need to solve the whole spectrum here. Uh, oh yeah, so let's just show that, I mean, just to show that something funny can be done if you take a double well trap, for instance. If you take a potential of this form and you change this B constant here, so you turn, you, you make the uh, middle uh, kink here, you make it uh, larger and smaller, you change the probabilities of, of ha being in the different kinds of configurations here. Uh, so if you take, uh, so the ground state is, uh, so the anti, the ground state is dominantly antiferromagnetic. You see it has a probability of about two thirds of finding the antiferromagnetic state in the, ground, uh, in the ground state here, and then smaller probability of the mixed and very small of the ferromagnetic. But if I take one of the other states, like the, so that's, so the ground state was this one, I take the third guy here, then actually it's the other way around. So now the ferromagnetic is almost 60%, the others are smaller. So there's, there's manipulation. Uh, so depending on how you prepare your states out here and what you come in through here, you can manipulate these correlations here. So you can get different kinds of, of, uh, of systems out this way. 
Um, then uh, let me just spend a few minutes on bosons here. Um, you can also think about this for, for doing a bosonic system. Now I draw the same sketch and it's the same story again. So it's the same story. Now I want to take two component bosons. So they are bosons with an internal state, which can either be an A or B. I just call them A or B, not to make this, yeah. You know, many people draw these arrows and then people think it's fermions, blah, blah, blah. So let's change that. Uh, so I call them A and B, but the story is exactly the same. And I would try to solve it in the same way. But now there's something funny because what you can now do is that you can consider a system where there is no AA interaction. So take a system where you take a three-body system, you don't take any AA interaction. Just put that to zero. The A's are non-interacting, but there's a very strong interaction between A and B. Now that's Hamiltonian looks like that, right? So the two and three will interact and the one and three will interact with the G2, which I will then take to infinity. And here's kinetic energy. And what you see is that actually uh, this is numerical, uh, that's uh, done by Artem in uh, stochastic variation using Gaussians. Um, and you get, um, actually that's the first application according to what we could find at least of this stochastic to exactly this kind of zero range problem with, with uh, bosons. And apparently, uh, but you can correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, apparently it uh, works extremely well. Um, uh, this is analytics, uh, is this line here. So we can do an analytical theory uh, along the lines of this a little bit different. Um, because Yes, because you don't have the condition of zero here. Oh. Because the, when the A and A meet, they don't need, there's no requirement. So how do you modify that? Yes, uh, that's, that, that's, the real, that's the real question. You go to a hyperspherical coordinate, you decouple. Uh, I think maybe we should talk about it this afternoon. I think it's a good question, but uh, let's, let's postpone it, uh, if, you, if that's okay with you. Okay. Um, Right, so, so you can, and you can get an analytical theory and you can compare and look looks very, very nice in the strongly interacting regime, um, as you can see from this picture. And then let me plot the wave function for you. And again, I'm using this, this uh, picture here with the, with the uh, so you see, here's the ground state. So this is the AAB configuration and this is the BAA configuration. So you see that the probability of finding AAB or BAA is the same and it's the only non-zero one. So in this kind of state here, that's the ground state. So if I go back to this picture, that's the state here. Coming in here. So in this picture, I only find a separated thing. So the two A's will go to the side and the B will go to the side. It will never sit in the middle in the ground state, this kind of system. Um, if I go to the first excited state, it's the other way around. So the first excited state, there's no probability of being in an AAB, but there's probability in the ABA configuration. So it's totally mixed in between these two guys. Uh, and you can do a second excited state. What happens is you get the same sort of thing, but in a second excited state, there's a radial node sitting here. That's all I wanted to see with this picture. And then you can compare to the ground state, uh, to the ground state of the fermions I was talking about before. And you see that in that case, there's big probability in the ABA uh, thing. And then there's also probability in the other things. So the fermions are mixed in in a different way. So here you see a big difference between um, the, the system I was talking about before and then this two-component sonic system. Um, okay, could you call it perfect uh, ferromagnet, perfect anti-ferromagnet? Well, okay, that's a good question. And then this morning, sorry, yes? So I, I'm still wondering, so I understand that this wave functions they come from the lowest one. Yes. When you really come to this point yes. where everything I, I do not know, can they really measure this kind of thing? Because when you come close, everything can mix with each other, right? So no, no, they, they have no overlap. So they're orthogonal states, so no. So they, don't, they don't do mixing. So it's real, there is not Unless there's some impure thing, that is, there, there has to be some breaking of, of the, the Hamiltonian break the spin or break, break something, you have to break something too. But you're yeah. saying if they really slowly follow yeah. this yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Right? yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's actually the exact eigenstates. That that's the that's the issue. Um, yeah. So sorry. <coughs> yeah. Sorry. Oh shit. Um, yes. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Like, wouldn't be exactly harmonic. So depending on um, the 
as long as it's spin independent, that doesn't make any difference. As long as it's spin independent, you can do any trap you like, as long as it's spin independent. Okay, we can discuss this later. I can see, but okay, uh, that 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 will be my that will be my claim. Um, in the experiment, what are A and B exactly? Like two different two different hyperfine states of, for instance, a rubidium atom. So that would be the two component bosonic system, as so to speak. You also have such an odd number of projections for that, right? Yeah, I mean, but you got to populate two of them. You got to make sure that you only populate. You do that yes, no yes, solution. absolutely, absolutely, to uh, such a high degree that it doesn't really matter for anything. Yes, you can do that. No, no, I, it's a very valid question because when you say two component bosons, people think, oh, that's been statistics, it doesn't work. It's, a, it's an engineered system. It's not a, yeah. All right. Uh, I got this this morning from my uh, grad student in Aarhus who computed four body also. Uh, and I just wanted to show you that you, you get, so, so what I did not, okay, yeah, shit. Uh, what I didn't say here is that you should actually notice the energy here. It's two and a half. So the energy is two and a half, right? Whereas if in the sort of fermionized energies would always be integer in the harmonic trap, right? Because I populate one, two, three, you know, take out zero point and all this stuff. But then it would always be integer, zero plus one <coughs> plus two. That would be the energy of this kind of state. And here, in these kinds of qu uh, cases, I actually get a fractional energy. So we call this fractional energy state, if you like. Um, so that, that's an important thing to notice. And then we thought, okay, that's pretty funny because when people say fermionized systems, strongly repulsive system that behave like fermions, you typically think of these anti-symmetric functions. And in a harmonic oscillator, they will always have an energy which is an integer times h bar omega, always, because you're just summing integers. Here you see something else. But of course, we turned off the AA interaction to get there. Remember that, I mean, it's a manipulation. But uh, nonetheless, it's an interesting one. Um, you can also do it for four body, and you see something similar. Um, and again, you see they don't necessarily go to um, integer values here. Um, I don't show this over here. I got a plot. It's a mess, because you have to figure out what's going where and what's a mo molecule. You saw it already in the 2 plus 1, so that's why I don't show this. Uh, and the guess is that this kind of state that you get here is probably of this structure. So it's a kind of an AABB kind of system. So it would again be some separated uh, system. I mean, we spent like 20 minutes trying to figure it out this morning. Um, but that we have not, I don't have a density plot for you. So I cannot back this up with anything. But this would be my guess, that it actually separates. So you would get a perfect ferromagnetic ground state, if you like. Right. Uh, OK, so let, let me uh, wrap this up. Um, OK. so. Uh, OK, so the first comment is about something about uh, Bose-Fermi mappings. OK, so we have a theory that can do stuff that this Bose-Fermi mapping <coughs> cannot do. Um, it's important that we connect these eigenstates in the spectrum, right? It's important that I actually know which branch, exactly your question. I got to know where I'm going, where I'm coming from, to know where I'm going. And this will define my correlations. So it's also something I can manipulate if I can change my starting point. Um, so that means that magnetic correlations can be accessible in this way. Uh, good agreement with experimental data. Maybe I should have put that in quotation marks. Um, then here's another point is that, you know, fermion bosons, they can be very different in the hardcore limit. I showed you a few examples. So, I, so this sort of thing that people say about hardcore, as soon as there's more than one internal state, you got to be very careful with this. Uh, that's, that will be my sort of statement about this. You have to be very careful, but we can actually solve this stuff. But I, I would say that most of the stuff that's in the literature right now has neglected this fact, that it's much more complicated. You can't just map it onto something where these coefficients are plus minus one or something like that. It's a more complicated problem you have to solve. Um, leads to engineering of ferro and uh, antiferromagnetic states. And then, of course, wave functions. For me, wave functions is the most important thing. The energies are not ve really very important to me uh, in this sense. I'm interested in wave functions, and that will also uh, bring me directly to my, uh, so, you know, my outlook. Um, so all of this stuff, uh, well, okay, I showed you mo some stuff for most of this. Uh, so my outlook is actually to do dynamics in these systems. And of course, for that, of course, I need to know the, the, um, the energy, but I need to know the wave function very well. I need to have 
you know, basically exact results for that to be able to do this kind of thing. Um, let me just uh, acknowledge uh, the people here. Of course, Artem uh, worked a lot on, on this stuff when he was a grad student and still does. Um, uh, Amy and my other grad student did the calculations on the four body. I have to thank my collaborators, Dimitri and Axel in Aarhus. Uh, Manuel Valiente, who's in Edinburgh, uh, um, worked on this project. And then uh, Jonathan Lindgren and Christian Fossein, Jimmy Otero in, uh, at Chalmers in Sweden did uh, a lot of the numerics that I was showing um, using uh, Lee Suzuki uh, transformation. In 1D it's very nice, right, because you, you don't have degeneracy of the single particle state, so you can go and it's very, very convergent and we could, but we had to check against analytical results. So the comparison there was very, very important for us. And it works just beautifully and it can go up to 10 particles and we still see that it fits with our analytical uh, um, intuition. Uh, and of course, I have to thank for unpublished data. I have to thank, uh, and for many, many nice discussions, I have to thank uh, uh, many people in uh, Selim's group in, uh, in Heidelberg. So uh, thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's, it's exactly the same mechanism as in a fastback resonance. It's just it's a fastback resonance where you now, the, the particles get squeezed into 1D geometry, which changes the, the, the interaction, the effective interaction you get out. So it is, it, the magnetic field is moving around um, uh, states in, in, the, in the different uh, magnetic channels. So it is the same mechanism as it's a fastback resonance, just in a different geometry. So you could replace this by a 1D scattering length or something like that? that yeah, 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 sure. It, it will, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's uh, one, over, one over length, I think, to get it to work. Yeah, yes. And, and it's very well defined. There's no regularization you need or anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just one question. In the experiment, can they always, when they start at some value of G and then they go to this cache resonance or this EQ resonance, can they deterministically at that starting G, prepare in which state they are? Yes, uh, they, they, they can with a pretty high uh, uh, let, yeah, yeah, fidelity or whatever you like to call it. They actually can. They can excite the, the other state. So that, that has been done as a check of the system. Uh, so, so yes, uh, not all states. I mean, because you do it by doing some shaking in a certain way. So that means that an operator comes in and so you need, it, it's not all states. But you can change the state, and for me, that that's good enough in some sense. That you can you can take a different starting point if you like. You probably have to worry that it's the case. <coughs> so, well, I mean, well, because what I mean, if you can take pictures and say, okay, data points, then each data point corresponds to a new preparation of the system. So if you would like really to see that you go through, you got to prepare. You, yeah, you, you got to be sure that you always did the same experiment. In agreed. Each sort of each picture. Yes, agreed. Yes. Okay. As always, but okay, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, but that's true, yes. Yeah. So, uh, after infinite coupling, the wave function strictly vanishes when two particles, interact particles. Exactly right, yeah. But uh, if you're slightly away from yes. infinite coupling, that's a very good question. the wave function uh, takes uh, the value of the wave function is of order one over g yes. when two particles coincide. Yes, yes. But this uh, variational wave function strictly vanishes. So Agreed. The experiment that you introduce a value of order 1 over g squared. Yes, I agree. It works to 1 over g. Yeah, yes, yes, sure. So then my sure. question is uh, how you can estimate uh, the coefficient in front of 1 over g squared. It's a good question. We're working on exactly this. No, no, it's, it, that's exactly the right question. How can you extend this to actually know the error of this thing? And there's, uh, you know, can, can you do perturbation theory to a higher order and see, see what happens, for instance? Or should you rather mix something like weak and strong coupling uh, solutions in, in or, or, you know, you can always compare to some numerics for the small system sizes. <coughs> so there you can, you can check how well am I doing on this. Um, my feeling is that perturbation theory is m a lot harder than you think because of the, th the reason you say it goes to zero and has a kind of kink behavior. So that mm -hmm. makes perturbation theory more difficult. I wonder if this uh, idea of uh, Handling the second order perturbation yeah. that was discussed yesterday, 
irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I agree. I thought about it last night, actually. Yeah, it, it could be, it could be. Yes, yes. It's impossible. Beta ansatz can only yeah. Not beta, be, it's it. I I. That's a way of speaking that I would not recommend in terms of talking about few body systems. Yeah. But I agree. I, and I and I think I learned in the last several months what that actually means. Um, beta ansatz can only work if you have uh, diffractionless scattering. So it's it's a condition where you need to start from these plane waves, and then and this you cannot do in a, in a trap. I mean you you. So as, as soon as you get something else which is not just simple plane waves, okay, there's one over R squared potential. There's some very special cases, but I'm talking about very general. I only showed results for harmonic oscillators, but it, it has nothing to do with that. Any 1D potential will do. Um, so, so the beta ansatz cannot solve confined things unless it's a box, because a box is also plane waves just in certain linear combination. So, and beta ansatz only becomes tractable once you take periodic boundary conditions. So there's some other stuff. Or oh, oh, oh the box. OK, or oh the box. If you replace the uh, harmonic operator by stamp operator, so the is a constant in each region, then can you still apply that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, probably you can, because you, if you can control the boundary and then between the two regions that you're talking about. Then I would, I would think you could. But you're starting to do kind of local density in some sense, because you're, unless you do it exactly right, you take a wave function from beta ansatz in each region, yeah. and then you, then you match them up. Um, I don't know. I've, I must see. I, I would think you could, but I've never seen it. I, that, yeah. Uh, 